Good morning. Let's all look at page 48. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Let's all stand. 548. Thank you for that. I appreciate uh, Steve leading that song. And so we're excited about uh, this weekend and everything it represents and the liberty that we have in this country. I know that we hear a lot of people complain about uh, what's going on in our country, but I'll, I'll still say this. I believe we have the best country in the entire world, and uh, we have the freedom to come in here and worship today, and uh, there's a lot of people that don't have that freedom that we're celebrating uh, th this morning. And so uh, thank you for those who talked this morning, and don't forget, we do have Rooted uh, for the children's age 3 through 5th grade. Uh, this evening, beginning at 540, and uh, we have middle school and high school in the youth room. We have moved it to 530 for this evening, 530 uh, for this evening, and then we will have evening worship at 6 p.m. This is our last uh, uh, sermon on the life of David. We're actually, he's, we're going to uh, experience his death and how he passed away and what happened with the, with what happened in his last words um, uh, tonight and then this coming Wednesday we will begin a study on the women of the Bible and uh, we're going to start with Hannah uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. and we'll we'll take several weeks and we'll go through some of the women of the Bible so we're excited about that and um, I pray you have a good time with your families tomorrow and the offices will be closed uh, uh, tomorrow on Monday uh, all day Monday July 4th um, and don't forget for the couple shower on July 16th for Michaela Petty and Joe Stone from 11 to 12. But you do have to RSVP uh, to Miss Tracy or Gina Stone. Uh, don't forget that Michaela and Joe are registered at Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, and also at Amazon. Everybody is registered at Amazon if you are not, I believe, right? Uh, we do have the deacon nominations coming up on July 17th. The four current deacons that we have are Robbie Barrett, Gib Patilli, Stephen Hunt, and Jason Davis. And those who are coming off the deacon board is Anthony Warden and Johnny Allred. So be praying about those who uh, you would like to nominate on July 17th for our deacon nominations. Uh, this coming... Um, this, we have our annual family night. Last time, I think we had 154 people for our organized family night at the park. So this coming, uh, the fifth Sunday of this month, we'll have another organized family night, and we'll have it here at the church. And there will be water slides for the kids and inflatables out in the parking lot and fun games. And also in here, we will have uh, in a controlled air conditioning environment for those who do not want to be out in the sun. We will have uh, games and uh, different things set up in here for you guys. Of course, we'll do bingo and, and uh, we'll have a good time with uh, our different festivals, uh, festivities. And I'm even getting a group, maybe a bluegrass group, to come in and uh, sing and be some uh, live entertainment for us. And so uh, we're excited about uh, our organized family night. Bring your family, bring your friends. And so we will have that coming up on July uh, 31st. We'll also feed you guys that night. And, um, and don't forget about Marywood camps that are coming up high school. Uh, and that will be next Sunday. And so we will leave 
uh, after, after your dinner. So it'll be about, I think it's about 1.30, 2 o'clock is actually when we'll pull out for our high school uh, folks. And then our juniors will leave on Monday the 18th and then middle school August 1st. And uh, we started this several years ago that uh, we used to take your student down and pick them up. But we, about three years ago, we tried something different. We are, we are asking that the parents actually pick up your own child. And I'll tell you why. It's because parents have actually thanked me for this. As they're coming back, the children are so excited and they're telling them everything that's going on. Now, by the time they get home, they're about wore out. But uh, they get to hear about all that experience. So we'll take, we have no problem. We'll take your, your student down. And then we're just asking for you to pick your student up uh, on that day. And then, of course, you can carpool with friends or whatever. But it's fun to hear all the stories about camp on the way back and so um and don't forget i'll have some announcements about the life and life of david at sight and sound and i have some information coming out on that uh this coming week and so are there any other announcements that i may have missed all right we do have somebody that has uh, graciously donated some arts and crafts and we're they're asking this to that they don't want their name to be known. They're just wanting it to be a blessing to you. Some of you have already taken advantage of that in the hall. Those are free. And so make sure you go by and visit that table. And uh, this is something that they wanted to do just to be a blessing uh, to each of you guys. Don't forget, uh, we can take Ty Davis off the prayer list. He was cleared this week from his concussion that he had several weeks ago when we appreciate uh, your guys' pray, prayer for him. Uh, Brenda Phelps, uh, she has been battling COVID, and uh, she is doing much better. They just released her to go back to work. But Betty Fields is actually still on the COVID unit uh, hall uh, at friend's home. And so even though I think she has... Uh, overcome her COVID and just pray for all those things going on with her. Jack and Shirley Goodwin, my uncle Larry Hamilton was kicked by a cow, uh, laid out in the field uh, this week, and uh, they did release him from the hospital and is doing better. Uh, Donnie Hodge uh, actually is with us. Uh, he has uh, had had surgery on Friday and uh, removed two kidney stones, and so those who have had those know that's not not fun and uh, he has an appointment Tuesday and uh, to, to finish uh, that procedure up and so he's actually here with us today uh, continue to pray for Dana Robbins and Diane Saint Singh and um, Bud Kennedy this is Nicole Phillips father he is in the hospital as a result of some complications with his diabetes and so uh, make sure that you're praying for Bud Kennedy and uh, Mary Ellen Thompson will be the last one that I announced that um, her brother, don't forget, her brother has passed away and uh, continue to reach out to this family and love on them. And I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, and is there any others from the floor? Okay, well, let's go to the word in, Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for what you have done, for how you've called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. And Lord, we ask for your help and your guidance today. As we look at your freedoms, as we look at your liberties, and that you've, that you've given to us through the sacrificial death of your son, God, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have Sarah singing today, and uh, they are kind of patriotic in, in, in a way, but listen as she sings Amazing Grace, and then, of course, I have been blessed.
I was listening to Fox News this week, and he was asking people, are you thankful to be in the country that you're in? And every one of the people they were asking out on the street said yes. They all had no, their view about what is going on in this country over the years, but they were all very blessed and thankful to be living here. And for those who have never left this country and seen other countries where uh, maybe socialism or commun communism prevails, you will, you are you don't have a, a grasp on what the rest of the world really is, what's taking place, and you need to, to look in and see what people are going through uh, in their lives. I do want to share something that happened yesterday, and um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to uh, view this later on, but uh, we're going to have a 90th church anniversary uh, this coming uh, March, um, and so... What we did, uh, some of you don't realize this, but there's a cornerstone uh, on one of the buildings out here. And we were able to take, remove that cornerstone and, um, and remove the contents that were within this cornerstone that were put there in 1966. And so we have everything uh, out, and it was really neat. And so what we're going to do, first of all, the, those who were there... Uh, during that time when that cornerstone was placed or earlier in this church, we're going to give you a chance to have a private viewing and go and look through some of these things. And uh, some of you were telling me, some of you were actually there when all of this cornerstone was placed in and, and even had the memory of a couple of the things that was in there. And, so, and then we're going to put this in a glass box and we're going to uh, put it on the wall uh, in the old chapel. And then our goal in March is we're going to reseal this cornerstone and actually update it with, with current stuff. And then maybe in 57, 60, 100 years, if God tarries is coming, then the next generation will take it and remove this. And some of you that are young in here, you know, that will say, I remember that, you know, if they did it 50 years ago. And uh, so we're excited about this coming year and being able to uh, recognize and, and have a dedication day uh, um, of church and uh, reset this cornerstone. And so uh, we're excited about that coming up. And, and so we're going to do that in March just because that was when uh, this was originally done. Actually, Feb February 11th, but uh, in 1967. But the, that, that building was actually completed in 66. And so we're just wanted to let you know about that. And if so, if you were here during that time, and you remember that being placed in there. I know that like Ernestine and Roy Duncan and, and uh, Barbara, I mean, there were several of you, but I want to make sure I don't miss anyone, that you're more than welcome to come to me. And, and so you see, I want to be a part of that private viewing. I was there, and, uh, and I'm going to give you a chance to have that time with each other. And so some of you can uh, reminisce and talk about all the things. We have uh, different items in there, such as um, it's in your... It's in your uh, in your bylaws and, and, and it tells exactly what's going on in there and um, the church history. That's how I found out about it. I, I read the entire book of church history that we have up to this point and that's where I learned about the contents of this. And so uh, there's the, the names of those who were uh, actually members, active and inactive members and uh, the bylaws up into that time. We have a newspaper article that describes what that day was like in the Greensboro News and Record. Uh, my son was actually looking through the newspaper. I think the most expensive car was like $2,500, uh, brand new, you know, in 1967. So uh, it is a really neat thing. And so we're going to give everybody a chance to view that. 
uh, uh, openly, but with the, in, the, in the glass box, everybody on that day, but we're going to have a time of a private viewing uh, with those who were there that day uh, so they can talk about and reminisce, and, and so we're excited about that. So just want to tell you something that's upcoming, uh, looking forward to in, in, in March. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, we're going to be in, uh, in verse 12. But I want to tell you that um, I, this is an interesting subject that we're going to talk about today that often people struggle with, uh, struggle with in their life. And it's called the freedoms or the liberties that we actually have in Jesus Christ. And so we do have a lot of liberties. In fact, when people get saved, they often look at themselves and they see Christianity as more of a restraint than they do as freedoms or liberties. And so what happens often is that when somebody gets saved, they often start putting restraints on their life. I can't, I can't, I can't, I cannot, I cannot do this, I cannot do this, I cannot do this, I cannot do this. And very rare, people look at Christianity are the things that we can do. The things that we can, that he's given us liberty to do and liberty uh, to, from. And so, by the way, this has been going on for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So how this chapter starts off in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about lawsuits. And, and it's very clear, Paul says that uh, one Christian is not to take the other Christian to court. Because how would we be viewed as two believers taking another one to court? And he says that's what the local assembly is for, to handle that within the local assembly. And by the way, if one did that, then, then they would be putting their self up for uh, discipline of the church. But then we get to the passage in verse 12, and he starts talking about freedoms. Freedoms that they did have. Now, I told you last week that the book of Acts is a very important book. In the book of Acts, is, it tells us about each and every one of these churches. Understand, when you read the book of Galatians, that was a church. Corinthians, that was a church, right? Thessalonians, that was a church. And so what the book of Acts does, it walks us through this journey as they went from church to church to church. And it, and it tells us how it began and who was in there. But what I want you to understand about... Corinthians is it was a pretty nasty place in fact it was a very nasty place I remember learning about Corinthians in my college classes and thinking this is a horrific place and I couldn't imagine being a Christian there and then I thought well is America really that much different is the world really that much different you know evil's been going on in the world since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden so I thought about what he was talking about, and I started thinking that Paul's handling what we can and cannot do, the liberties that we have in Christ, because what was happening in Corinth is that they were taking their liberties way too far. And Paul begins this delicate balancing act of bringing them back. These are new believers. New believers. If you've ever been around a new believer, it's interesting talking to them because you're very careful. Like some of the things that they even still say and they think, you know what, is it okay that I say this or is it okay that I do this? And you're walking through and you're discipling them. You also want to make sure that you don't add crazy rules just like the Jews did. And we're going to talk about all the dietary rules that they added to them just because... They said, if you really want to be a follower of God, you need to do this and do this and do this. And the more you do, the more that we'll see that you really love God. And let me tell you, that's a very dangerous way to live your Christian life. Because you're basing your goodness and your righteousness off of the things that you do. And remember, any righteousness that comes from you, we know that that is a bloody rag, filthy rag. And so Paul is sitting here handling, there's something that's going on, and I'm going to tell you what that is in chapter 6. And he was like, oh, no. But when we think of freedoms, there's, there's certain or liberties, we generally think of things such as Patrick Henry where he says, give me liberty or give me death. We think of soldiers fighting for this freedom. You know, oftentimes people get discouraged and talk about our soldiers are fighting on other places. And oftentimes they're fighting it there so we're not, not fighting it on our own soil. I thought about the Afghan people. And I thought about how many years that they have fought battles. You, 
if you study how many countries have been in there and fought and fought and fought, they've been fighting hundreds of years. But our, these soldiers are fighting for our freedom. And oftentimes we look at it that way. But not only this, there's something very important is the freedom of speech when we think of freedom. The, the importance of freedom of speech is, is, is crucial to our society. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's going to be things that will be said around you and on the news this week. And people will say it to you and to your face that you will not like. But I want to tell you, because they have the freedom to say that, we also have the freedom to, what, preach the gospel on the streets. We also think about the freedom of religion. Can you imagine us not being able to meet here this morning? Or us meeting in a basement? But I'll tell you, the places that experience this type of restraint in their religion... We see these countries growing in their Christianity leaps and bounds. People are, are excited about their relationship with Jesus Christ. They're meeting in basements. They're meeting in houses. They're meeting undercover. And they're trying to not be killed for their faith. But we had that freedom this morning. We also think about the freedom of the press. When we think about or hear the word freedom. But lastly, we think about the freedom of assembly. That people are free to assemble and to stress and voice their opinion about what they feel is right. We have seen this recently with Roe versus Wade and pro-life versus pro-choice. And people are lined up along the streets. And some of them were violent. But the majority of them were simply them saying, I'm taking a stand for where I believe is right. And so, you know what, there's going to be things and freedoms and people's freedoms that we're going to be appalled at. We're going to be like, how are you thinking that way? And I want you to understand this, is that if they're, if they're not a follower of Jesus Christ, they're thinking the exact way they should be thinking. They're thinking like an unbeliever. There's going to be ways and things that freedoms that people are going to, to live their life and we're not going to agree with them. But because they have those freedoms, we have our freedoms. But there's some things that freedoms that the laws of this country cannot protect you or I from. You see, our Constitution is a very, very valuable document and something that we should continue to hold dear to our hearts and, and make sure that it is defended. Or you could be like other countries where they wrote constitutions and then they went back and rewrote them and rewrote them and rewrote them. And there's people in this country that would love to rewrite the constitution. And that will be a very, very dangerous thing because once you start that, that is a slippery slope. It will be changed hundreds and hundreds of times. But there are some freedoms that our laws here in this country cannot protect you from. And it's the freedom of, from sin. The sin is going to be prevalent in this country and in our lives until sin is abolished when Satan is cast away forever and sin is dissolved. Freedom from sin's eternal consequences. The law cannot protect you from that. You know, the, the law can step up and put somebody in jail that has done something to you or to your family, but not from eternal consequences. Because honestly, once the death penalty has been put in place, that's it, isn't it? You've paid your price to society, but there's an eternal consequence for sin that the law cannot protect you from. Not only this, is freedom from hopelessness and despair without Christ, and fourthly, freedom from death. I even heard this this last couple of weeks. There's two things that's going to happen, and it's what? Taxes and death, right? And so the law, no matter what kind of laws are governed or no matter what kind of money you have, that you, the law cannot protect you from death. That if Jesus Christ continues and, and he doesn't come back at this point, that we are going to die. I was riding down the road this week and I thought about, if you just had enough money, you could live, right? Steve Job, I mean, um, um, the, the guy that, Ran Apple. What was his name? Jobs. Steve Jobs. Is that right? Steve Jobs. I was trying to put the builder in there. Job. Steve Jobs. And, and I thought about all the, the income that he had and the best doctors in the entire world and they couldn't save his life. I thought about all the, the kings in the world that 
one day that the Queen of England and, and the, all the money she has, she's going to die one day. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter. The law cannot protect you from death. So what is freedom, really? Freedom in Christ is found in John 8, 31. It says, it, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And then he said this, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This, this week, I got to disciple a man that received Christ as his Savior last week. I got to talk to him and hear about his journey, and he talked about all the books that he had read, and finally, he got to the point where he said, Chris, I just had a revelation that you got to confess, and Jesus Christ is the only way. Why? What happened? He understood the truth and the truth has set him free. Do you remember the day that the truth has set you free? Do you remember that day that when you accepted Christ as your Savior and you were free, you were free indeed. But it was all because of the truth. So as we get into the freedoms that we're looking at, balancing our freedoms is very important because people have battled with this because there was extreme legalism on one side and there's extreme liberty on the other. Extreme legalism says you have to wear this length dress, you have, to, you have to go to these places and these places only and you can only read this version of the Bible and you can only do this and you can only do this and you can only do this and then you start questioning them why, then they get angry. Why do they get angry? Because that's what they were told. And they don't really have any scripture to back it up. They just feel this way. And that's okay. And that's okay that that's the way you want to live your life. And there's, But when you start forcing other things on other people that are not scriptural, then that's when confusion and anger comes into play. So what happens, and this is what I've seen in my generation, I have seen where legalism has been forced upon people and they get so fed up with it because they realize this is not right. And what do they do? They come over all the way over to this side and they start practicing extreme liberties. Well, I have the freedom to do this and I can do this and I can do whatever I want to do and I'm never going back to that again. And so what you're going to see in this passage today, you're going to see a very careful balancing act. And you're going to see Paul take a group of people that are new believers. And he was like, look, the last thing I want to do is bring you over here and put a bunch of do's and don'ts on your life. Because you're going to realize really quickly that that's, it's not based upon what you do or don't do. But also I'm going to try to pull you from over here. And say you have the freedom to do everything you want to do. So as I told you that this city of Corinth, you ought to study it out sometime, was a very, very nasty place. There were actually about seven gods that they actually celebrated and, and had sacrifices to and paid tithes to. But one of the goddesses that they had was the goddess Aphrodite. The goddess of love, the goddess of sex, the goddess of sensual gratification. And there was, now by the way, this is an, uh, an artist's rendering of what it would have looked like. If you see behind there, that would have been a Medi Mediterranean sea. So you would have had to go to the top of one of these mountains. And you could have looked out, and this was this sacred temple to the goddess Aphrodite. And you could have looked over this Mediterranean sea, and you would have had this beautiful, nice breeze blowing through there. And it was a beautiful location. And sailors and captains, they would come in with their, with their where goods and supplies and being unloaded. And they would visit the temple of Aphrodite. Why? Because it was a place of prostitutes. They said in this one temple at one time, they knew that there were 1,000 prostitutes. In this one building. In this one time. Could you imagine? 
What a gross, nasty place this would have been. Now, what did they do with the money that was given to the prostitutes? By the way, it wasn't just women. And it wasn't just men. It was also little boys. Because what the Greek men believed was this, is that the wife, her job was just to bear children and to take care of the children. But it was the prostitute's job for his pleasure. And so they had this nasty place and the city was filled with this and they were worshiping this goddess. So what they would do is these sailors and these townspeople, they would come and they would pay their money to the prostitutes. And that money would go right into this beautiful temple. And word got out, and money came flooding into Corinth. You had a very important merchant dock there that goods and supplies were coming in. You had all of this money that was flowing in, and Corinthians became extremely wealthy, and people made lots of money in this place as a result of this. And so these prostitutes, it was the same as sex trafficking is what it was. Wealthy Greek men would tithe to this temple. You know what they would do? They would go buy these women that were not theirs to buy. And they would donate them to the, their goddess Aphrodite. They would take these boys and they would donate them. And what they would do, they would have individual rooms. And these rooms, at the tops of these rooms, it would kind of give a description of what this person was best at. And that's how they chose. It was a nasty place. One Olympic winner gave 100 women at one time as his sacrifice to Aphrodite. In fact, there's a proverb that would be said about the merchants and the sailors that said it would be best to pass through Corinth because you will have no money when you leave. Because they would spend so much of all their money, the captains and the sailors would spend all their money here at this temple. You can imagine the money that was flooding in. And now Paul visits this gross place. And where people would say, Paul, I cannot believe you would visit there and you would be around such filth. And he said, what did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come to call those who are not sick. I came to call the sick, right? Those who are well don't need a doctor. It's those who are sick. He said, I didn't call those who were righteous or perceived themselves as righteous. That's why the Jews and the Pharisees, they rejected me because they were already righteous. They perceived that even though they were not. He said, so I have to go to the places that are like this. And a church is born. But it's very important that you understand the background of what is going on in this city. Before you can understand this passage. Because if you understand that, now you understand there was a problem. There was a lot of discipleship needed. And this is what Paul is doing. He begins to disciple these new believers. And he's writing this letter to them saying, we have a problem. What they were doing... Only thing they knew was the worship from the Aphrodite temple. And what they were doing, they were bringing their worships into the Christian church. And their practices into Christianity. And they were bringing these practices into the Christianity. Can you imagine? The Aphrodite worship and sacrifices and the practices. And now we bring them into the local church. And this is what they were doing. Why? Because they didn't know no better. This is all they knew. 
By the way, we hear this. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, society finds it acceptable. Society finds it acceptable now, so it must be right. Oh, that was from the old school. People don't think that way no more. People don't believe that way no more. Get up with the new thinking. And so what these people in Corinthians could have said, oh, it's socially acceptable to still have prostitutes and I'm a Christian because the wife is just designed for being a mother and birthing babies, but I can still fulfill the lust of my flesh through prostitution. And I can be a Christian. Why? Because society says it's okay. And Paul was going, no, no. And so he has this practice of having to explain that just because society says it's okay and it says it's, a, it's possible that you can have a prostitute and society doesn't look at you any other way, all of a sudden they're introduced to Jesus Christ and they've given their life to Christ and they're like, I'm having these desires of the flesh that I had fulfilled with these prostitutes all this time before. Now I'm, I should be able to still fulfill them. And you know what the amazing thing is? It's Society would have been like, "Eh, okay. I mean, that's what we do. So the next time you hear somebody say this, oh, people don't think that way no more. Oh, that's from the old school. And it goes against the teaching of Scripture, say, yeah, there was this church in Corinth that society taught them it was still okay to have prostitutes despite they were Christians. And so... We get into verse 12. Paul says, All things are permitted for me, but not all things are of benefit. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so now you understand the background to this passage, and you're understanding that Paul is now teaching these new Christians about Christians' liberty. What you have freedoms to do and what you don't have freedoms to do. And Paul has this battle here. He doesn't want to bring them under this teaching of of the Jewish law and the do's and the don'ts. But what he's doing here is he starts the first part of this verse. He says, all things are permitted. And oftentimes there's a lot of people that are so tired of the do's and the don'ts. They read this portion of the scripture and they go, okay, that's enough. I'm good. See, the Bible says that all things are allowed. All things are permitted. I can do and say and live as I want because I have Christian liberties in all things. Because that's what Paul said. So you can imagine as the Corinthians are reading this and they're going, yeah, yeah, that's good. I have been permitted. I have freedoms. But why did Paul start it with this? Why didn't he start off by saying, you crazies, you can't have prostitutes and be a Christian. Go home. <laughs> he said, look, I have freedoms. What he was, why did he say it this way? Why did he start this passage this way? And it was because of this. He was like, the last thing I want to do is lead you under a legalistic teaching. I don't want to lead you under what the Jews would have said. Hey, We don't do it that way. Let me tell you what you're supposed to eat now. Let me tell you exactly what you're supposed to drink now. We're going to tell you exactly how to worship. In fact, let's just do away with this whole New Testament thing, and let's just open up the Old Testament. God's already spelled it out in his laws and his commandments. You have to do it this, on this day, this particular way, and here it is. Boom, 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 boom. And you know what the truth is? Is there some people in in Christianity that still try to practice this. They'll say, because I didn't do this and I don't go here, I am right with God. You are right with God, not because of what you do and don't. You are right with God because of Jesus Christ. That's it. Do not say, but, or, and. There's no and and there's no but. You are right. With God because of His Son. That's it. Not because what you do or don't do. 
Either you have a standing with God through your relationship in Jesus Christ or you do not. And so Paul is trying to get this across. He says that all things are lawful or permitted to me. He says, I can do these things because I have a liberty in Christ. But also he's trying to have this balance. Paul looks like that tightrope walker, don't he? I am permitted to have liberties and freedoms in Jesus Christ. But I also don't want to be far. I don't want to be this way. I want to understand what is the balance in my life. So the question, the first thing that I should ask you this is, was Paul excusing the prostitution here when he says all things are permitted? No, absolutely not. Because we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, but in verse 15 it says, Do you not know that your bodies are parts of Christ? Shall then I take away the parts of Christ and make them parts of the prostitution? Far far, far, far from it. He said, "Mm -mm, you can't be in Christ and be with a prostitute at the same time. He said, Far be from it. And then later on he says, flee from this sexual immorality. Flee from it, run from it. But then he says, I have the freedoms and I'm permitted to do all things, but guess what? All things are not beneficial for me to do. And now this is when the Jews would have said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's just black and white. I mean, it's just we do or we don't. He says, just because I have a freedom to do something doesn't mean that that's what's best. Just because I have a freedom to do certain things in my life, and I may have a freedom to do something where Charles may not have the freedom to do something, or Charles has a freedom to do something, and I don't have the freedom. He says, says, not everything is a benefit. He says, I want you to understand, because I am permitted, I don't have a license to sin. And then he goes on, he says, but by the way, he says, I will not be mastered by anything. I will not be mastered by anything. And this is where I hold and stand on a tightrope all the time. And you should too. The word mastered here is somebody that is being held against their will. Talked about sex trafficking. What a awful awful thing that's going through our city our little towns the greensboro the burlington's the high point it's all around us they tell us on the news to watch out for people being held against their will in fact this week i saw a man and a woman and the first thing i thought was i wonder if she's being held against her will seeing her face and who she was, and I just immediately had that feeling like, I wonder if she's being held. Because it's all around us. And he says, do not let something hold you against your will or to be controlling over your body. He says this, he says, I am permitted to do all things, but not all things are a benefit. He says, but don't let yourself be mastered by anything. Meaning indulgences that control us are wrong and they bring us into bondage. I was talking to a pastor a couple weeks ago and I said, I said, you know, there's funny the things that are not taught against in a Baptist church like gluttony. We would never speak of that, especially before a homecoming meal, right? You know, the Bible never tells us how much we should or should not eat. You will never find that in the Scriptures. And I'm glad, aren't you? Aren't you glad that he doesn't say two pieces of cake are okay, but three are sin? Because then you would say three in a day, three in an hour. And you know what would happen? People would take that little passage right there and they would go, oh, Two pieces of cake, oh, are you eating three? You know what they would do? They'd pull you right back in to legalism. And then they would start coming up. I think he means three in a week. 
You know why I'm glad he didn't put that? And he doesn't tell us how much we can and cannot eat. He just says this. He says, do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or gluttonous eaters of meat. Proverbs 23, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come into poverty. He puts those who are drunks and those who are gluttons in the same category. And there's people that are mastered by certain foods and they can't control themselves. But they would say, I've never been drunk. And they hold themselves to a higher esteem. And I'm glad that he doesn't put, you can have this many pieces of cake or you cannot. I'm glad he doesn't say that because he says, just don't be controlled by it. Don't be mastered by it. Don't be mastered by anything. Don't let it control you. And by the way, he's not permitting, don't ever get me wrong. He's not permitting that as long as the prostitution doesn't control you, you're okay. He does, he's not saying that at all. He's very clear. Now, why do we need to have this balance? And then he goes on and he tells us in verse 15, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are parts of Christ? Shall I then take away the parts of Christ and make them parts of a prostitute far be from it? He says, Do you not know? Why did he say, Do you not know? You know why? Because they didn't know. Do you understand? Have you ever talked to a new Christian and they'll say something? They'll cuss. And you'll be kind of taken back. And they're like, am I not supposed to say that? It's probably best you didn't. You know, let me tell you why. Because the Bible says that blessings and cursings shouldn't come from the same mouth, right? And they're like, oh, oh, I, I didn't know. And he says, do you not know? And they're going, I can't have prostitutes no more? I can't bring these and, and worship like I did? No. He says, why? Because your members, your bodies are now members of Christ. He says, when your body comes into the sexual immorality, it not only disgraces you, it disgraces the body of Jesus Christ. And here's the real thing we should be looking at. Is it going to disgrace the body of Christ? And by the way, sexual sins are the only sin that you see. It's just a little bit different. Because... It affects the very soul of a man and a woman. And that's why couples struggle for years and years and years after having sex in their dating time period. And they carry that in their, message, in their, in their marriage and they still battle with this. And he says, when we commit a sin, it is a disgrace to not only our body, but the whole body of Christ. And now they're going, you know what? I don't get to fulfill the lust of my flesh just because I feel like it, just because I want to. He says, no. <laughs> and by the way, he goes on, and he talks about eating and drinking in here too. And he says, look, don't just eat and drink whatever you want to do. He says, you got to make sure that it doesn't disgrace or you're mastered over it. It just, this doesn't disgrace the body of Christ. And he says, by the way, now you're going to understand this passage, some of you, for the very first time. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Why did he say temple? Because what was sitting on top of that mountain, looking over, looking the Mediterranean Sea? The temple of Aphrodite. And he said, your body is not the temple of Aphrodite. But you have a new owner. And it's the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. And you are not your own. You can't go and just do whatever you want to do because it doesn't, it doesn't have benefit. You're being controlled by it. You have something bigger and better now. There's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And now we are starting to separate ourselves from the world. We're living in this world, but I have to separate myself from my fleshly desires and fleshly lust. And that's why in verse 13 he talks about, well, food is for the stomach. He's not giving permission saying, oh, look, just fulfill the lust of your flesh. He says, 
The temple is the Holy Ghost. He says, because you were bought and you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify your body in God. Because now he starts saying this. That if you know that your body is no longer yours, are you going to take care of it differently? Are you going to spend it on prostitutes? Has anybody ever loaned out something and it's come back broken? Anybody in here? Two people. How many of you have ever stopped loaning out stuff because it comes back broken? More of you raise your hand on that. <laughs> There's never a better compliment than when somebody loans you something and it comes back in better shape. Than the, way they, than the way they loaned it to you. I got a really cool call one time, and I had borrowed a tiller from somebody, and I'd fixed it, repaired it, washed it, took it back. And he calls me, and he says, do you need to borrow anything of mine? It was a random call, and I said, huh? He said, do you need to borrow anything of mine? I got some things that need repair, and I started laughing. I said, are you kidding me? He's like, I was just wondering if you need to borrow anything. Because truthfully, honest people are going to take care of something that doesn't belong to them better. And so what he's trying to get across is, is when you gave your life to Christ, you are not giving it to whom? Prostitutes. It's not yours to give. That's, now we tie in the rest of the passage, ready? Where he says your body's not your own, you've been bought with a price, but also husbands, wives... Your body is not yours, it is your wife. Wives, your body is not yours, it's your husband's. You gave it to them, not to give it to anybody else. And he says, your body has been bought, it's been purchased by who? God. Who owned that prostitute for that short time? The person who purchased her or him for that time. And he said, ready? You've been bought, paid for, for the rest of your life. And we belong to God. Now, how many of you manuscripts, how many of you, your Bible says, glorify your God in body and in spirit? Some of you, if you look... It says, and in spirit. In fact, the oldest manuscripts doesn't even have in spirit in there. Probably some scribe wrote that in there later on. Because it, maybe it sounded spiritual. He's not wrong, but I'm just saying, in the oldest manuscripts, it says, glorify God in your body. Harry Ironsign said this. He said, if you glorify your God in your body, then your spiritual will take care of itself. What am I saying? That Paul was not talking about, he was talking about a spiritual issue, but what is he more dealing with is the body. And having the proper balance in our lives. So as I've gone through this, I thought, you know what, what are some questions that we can ask ourselves and I'm finished? How do I have that balance in my life? And this is not you pointing a finger at somebody else and say, you know what, if you were really right with God, you would do this and this and this. And we're not talking about sin here. We already know that that needs to be handled. Good gracious. We're talking about things that we don't want to fall back into legalism, but we also don't want to have, say, I'm free to do everything I want to do. How do you know? One of the things you can ask yourself, is this really necessary? Is it necessary that I do this? Something else. Is this really the best choice for my life? Another question you could ask yourself is, could it be potentially destructive in my life? Another question is, will I offend another Christian if I do this? Will it offend an, a younger Christian if I do this? Will I hurt the body of Christ? Will it hurt my testimony And last, is it right?
you know, the Bible says to those who know to do good and do it or not, it is what? It is sin. To those who know to do good or do right, do you know if it's right for you? And if you can say, I know this is okay for me, ask yourself these other questions saying, look, because I may have certain freedoms that you don't have, you may have certain freedoms that I don't have, because of backgrounds, because of cultures, because of a lot of different things that are not necessarily sinful, but I may have certain freedoms. But I have to be careful with that freedom. So I want you to view today that Christianity is not about a bunch of do's and don'ts, these freedoms we have in Christ, but be careful with the freedoms that we exercise. We don't want those freedoms taken away when we don't take advantage of those freedoms either. I want you to think in your life, how do I walk this balancing beam in my life? As Steve and Sarah come to dismiss us in a song, let us pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for this 4th of July and the independence that we celebrate on this day. God, I am thankful that we are celebrating as Christians as being separate and, and we can be independent from the world even though we live in the world. These Christians could live in Corinth while being surrounded by a very nasty place. But there were people there that you loved and cared for that needed the gospel. We're thankful that Paul chose to try to win these people. In Jesus' name, amen. Steve.